Hi, I'm excited to do a substructure reading for you. Um, this reading is going to cover the four transformations, also called the four radical transformations, which are really what Ra laid out as the four steps to completely transforming um, the life, which goes beyond just the form, because the form is really on the design side. And, and Ra pointed out the transformations on the design side are the most profound um, in terms of, you know, being a, akin to following strategy and authority. But the transformations on the personality side are really all about transforming the mind, transforming the personality and transforming the awareness. And um, he pointed out how some people can be in human design and they get it and they're living according to their design, but they still haven't transformed their awareness Others, you know, try to transform the awareness and they can't transform the design. So they, they're both important. Of course, following strategy and authority is really for the design uh, and it's for you and it's for you to get what is really you. Transforming the awareness is really for others. It's for your outer authority. So just to start with the four transformations, they are determination, which is your dietary regimen, your design sun earth. They are your environment, which is your design nodes, view or perspective, which is your personality nodes, and motivation, which is your personality sun earth. And these build like a pyramid. It needs a foundation. The foundation is the dietary regimen. The foundation is the, de the determination. And then from there, you become sensitized and you're able to detect what is your correct environment. Once you're in the correct environment, you get to view, which you can start to notice what is right for you to see in that environment. And then once you're seeing what you're here to see, you're really able to reach that crowning achievement, that pinnacle, which is the true outer authority of motivation, where you're here to actually uh, express your unique, your unique awareness to others in the way that it's meant to be expressed. And you're able to communicate to them and to, to connect to them. So it really is layers that build up. And so these four transformations, uh, they have to do with color and tone. So in this reading, I'm gonna go through color and tone for each, um, basically each of the four transformations. So I have your chart here, and this is one uh, I've generated on humanarchetypes.com, and it actually has color, that's C, and then it has tone. The percentages are telling you how far into that you are. So if tone changes every 39 minutes, well, you're 40% into it. If your birth time is accurate within 20, 30 minutes on each side, then the tone doesn't change but your base is only 3% in. Uh, base is not part of the four transformations, but I'm happy to go into it since we're doing a substructure reading and just kind of cover the base a little bit. Um, basically, you're either going to be a base three or a base four. Base changes every seven minutes, something like that. So you're really only a few seconds, maybe you're 20 seconds into base four, or you know what I mean? If you were born one minute earlier, you would be base three. So it's going to be something for you to figure out from the keynotes of base, which base actually applies to you. Um, base is not the easiest thing to discern or to teach in a short way. I mean, base is something that goes very deep and really involves um, a number of epiphanies, kind of these aha moments where you start to really get it and see how it plays a role in so many different ways because base is so core and it's also then it has so many applications and it can really drive someone crazy i mean ra said that when he learned about base that was the closest he came to to becoming mad probably since his encounter with the voice but he really said it, it led him to a certain form of madness because he began to see base in all things he began to see everything as divided by five. There are five bases. And he began to see that the formula for any and everything, the essence of all things, is different combinations of these five bases. It could be all five parts could be base one, or it could be three parts base one and two parts base two, 
or it could be one part base one, one part base two, one part base three, two parts base four, any permutation, right? Or it could be one equal part of each base or all base five or all base three or a combination of three and five or two and four, any of these. I mean, every possible combination of bases, every possible permutation. And so if you're looking at music, genres of music, every genre of music in some sense, has a different combination of bases of its essence. Every band has a different combination of bases of its essence. It's really understanding that, I mean, even every person in some sense, because even though this is your personality base, obviously there are um, the nodal bases as well. Um, but, you know, for a person, you tend to contribute what is your personality base. That is, and because of the mathematics, the design base will always be one less than the personality base. So all base three people have a base two design, all base four have a base three design, and so on. So with base, you know, it's it's too much. I mean, I could do a whole hour just talking about base. If you're interested in base, you can learn more deeply about it through independent research, listening to Ra's lectures and, and different materials on base. But the short of it would be base four is the principle of design itself and the principle of the ego. And so base fours are very resistant to human design, typically, because they want to design something themselves, come up with their own names, their own interpretations. If I had to guess, I think you're a base three, because base three seems to fit your personality a lot better. But I don't want my guess to be the reason why you identify with one or the other. I think it's much better when the time comes to learn deeply about base and see which one fits. Base three is the double yin, and it's basically here to cooperate in the service of cooperation. And so base three is really here to help people cooperate and get along and to use sexuality and food and comfort to keep everything running smoothly. It's the mother, symbolically. If we see base one is the father, base two is the eldest son, base four is the eldest daughter, base five doesn't have any, any connotation because it's the space in between the bases. But base three is the mother. And just from our personal, from personally knowing you, that one seems to fit better because base four people are also extremely different. They're the most mysterious and can be the most difficult for base three. They're opposed. So our mutual manifester comedian friend is base four. And it wouldn't surprise me if someone like uh, our other friend who kind of made a derisive comment about mystery meat sack, is also a base four. It's hard to, hard to say, but uh, in any case, base three has a much more inclusive attitude and base four can be a little bit elitist and snide and put down and stuff like that. And I just don't see you as that kind of person. Ra was base four. Ra was a bit of an elitist and a bit of a, you know, he made human design. He designed it. If somebody gave him human design already made, he wouldn't touch it. That's base four. They're all about, um, yeah, I'll just, I'll stop sharing for a minute while we talk about uh, base, but yeah, it's um, base three is really at a core level here. Oh, also it's the body. It's the principle of the body. But at a core level, it's here to make sure we know how to cooperate with each other. And base four is here to make sure we have a backbone and stand up to authority and to make sure we really think for ourselves and act for ourselves and be selfish. So base four is the principle that says, be selfish, have a backbone empowerment, you know, that's Ra's thing. Base three is the one that says, we have to get along. If we can't find a way to work together, uh, then we're doomed. And so, I mean, there's much more to it than that. Uh, I'm kind of just giving a high level synopsis, but I would just say, uh, if you were born even one minute earlier, you're base three. So consider either of those. Definitely don't take base four as, um, as a definite thing, because, um, for all we know, I mean, uh, you know, the, the birth time is, is one minute later or something like that, or is, it, is actually one minute earlier than, than was recorded. So just um, 
definitely when you learn base, consider that you might be base three. Okay, so I think uh, I'm just gonna begin the four transformations analysis. And I'm just gonna kind of go through one at a time. They each build on the previous. So the foundation of all of the of human design and of the four transformations is the design sun earth. In fact, Ra commented that the design sun earth tone is really our direct connection to our inner authority. And obviously inner authority can be through conscious definition, through personality activation and so on. I don't think he means it that literally. I mean, some people have a design sun earth that are in undefined centers or you know uh, reflectors for instance whose whose lunar authority um right is, is kind of different but they still access it i think what ra meant here is that the tone is really the intelligence of the design the intelligence of the form the intelligence of the unconscious so when you're doing hypnotherapy or hypnosis you're accessing this but the thing is, first, we have to understand how tone gets out. How does tone make it out? When the neutrino comes into the crystal of consciousness, the crystals of consciousness are two or three neutrino widths wide, and they only allow in one neutrino at a time. One it goes in, goes out, goes in, goes out, goes in, goes out. And one at a time, just tens of thousands per second, these neutrinos are just streaming through it just streaming, this neutrino stream is just going through this filter. And when it enters, the entrance frequency is base. So it's almost like angle. It's, it's, um, it's almost like you could think of it as the angle that the neutrino enters or the orientation of the crystal against the neutrino stream. Like if it's rotated a little bit, it goes here and it rotates over, it goes there and so on. If the crystal is kind of spinning and then it freezes at the moment of birth, not literally, but you could think of it that way because it's what it's essentially doing uh, is crystallizing or freezing that entrance frequency. And that always remains the same. It's always the same. And in fact, what's interesting is base is the only thing that doesn't change life after life. You can have a different tone, a different color, different lines, channels, profiles, everything. But base remains the same. You will always incarnate on the fourth base of your respective gait and line and color and tone. If you're of base four, if you're base three, you will always incarnate on the third base. You'll always incarnate as a base three. It's just the way it works. So base never changes that's the entrance frequency but again we don't really look at that in four transformations it's more interesting to look at the personality base because that's really what um, is an overarching theme life after life after life after life not just this incarnation but all incarnations so once the neutrino hits the crystal and then goes into the crystal then it goes out while it's inside the crystal, that frequency inside the crystal is what we call tone. And I like to think of it as like a Princess Leia hologram from Star Wars, like a little image of you. There's an image of your entire body in each and every design crystal. Because, you know, by the way, the design crystal we look at here is what we could call the prime design crystal. It's the design crystal in the Ajna, just as the personality crystal is above the Ajna. The design crystal is in the Ajna, in the third eye. Uh, some people think it's in the G-center, but that's that's a mistake. The G-center is uh, where the magnetic monopole is, and the design crystal is in the Ajna, and it doesn't actually go, It's they're held apart. And they, they love each other, so to speak, if we could anthropomorphize, and they want to be together, but they can't be together until the moment of death. At the moment of death, the design crystal goes, finally is, stops being held apart, collapses to the g-center finally the love is consummated the design crystal gets to be with its love its magnetic monopole and then it, the magnetic monopole with the design crystal kind of attached goes down through the root and into the earth's mantle and the personality crystal sticks around kind of, you know, above the head and gets to experience the bardo state for up to 72 hours before getting picked up by its prime crystal bundle or by a rogue crystal bundle. 
But in any case, the um, prime design crystal is what we're looking at here, but every cell in the entire body has its own design crystal. Every single cell in the entire body. We know this from the design of cells. And so every cell has its own crystal of consciousness. So think about how many millions of crystals of consciousness are being formed every moment as new cells, you know, they're coming in and, and, and then guiding the cell where it needs to go. This is how the body can be so intelligent. It doesn't just have two crystals of consciousness. It has two gazillion trillion, however many cells there are in the body, right? So um, each one of those cells has a tone also. And that tone is essentially a holographic image of the entire body. Something to think about. So this tone is really the intelligence. We call it the cognitive architecture or the underpinning of intelligence of the body's intelligence. And then we have the exit frequency. So the neutrino comes in, that's base. Inside the crystal is tone, and then it's exiting. And when it exits, that is color. That's what we call the exit frequency. And so the exit frequency of color, this is where it gets distorted. When the color transfers, what we call color transference, it's kind of like you're playing a flute. And it's like, ba, 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 you know, it kind of hits an off note, ba, ba, that kind of squeak, that squeal, that is transference. And when that happens, the, the tone is distorted and lost. See, the tone is meant to be carried by the color. The tone is sort of a, holist, a holistic holographic image of the form. So just, just imagine a ballet dancer doing pirouettes and they're so incredible and you're looking at them and everyone in the audience is clapping and they're in awe and they're being touched by it. How? Because that ballet dancer is a master an incredible master where their entire body, they're in a flow state where every cell in their entire body has a hologram of the form that the entire body takes. And it's all getting out so cleanly, so cleanly. Or think of a really amazing acting performance where the actor, there have been neuroscience studies where actors are shown to be in flow states during their performance. The flow state is a full body synchronization where every cell in the body is humming and resonating and kind of correct, you could say, you know, and letting out the tone, the tone is making it to the surface. And then you see bad acting, that's where there's an inner image of what the body should do, but it can't make it out. So the body can't do it. The ballet dancer trips and stumbles. The, you know, Olympic diver belly flops. The actor gets nervous and they basically the image of the perfect performance, which exists at the tonal level, can't make it out at the surface level because the color is transferred. And so for you, you have color for calm. That transference is to appetite, single ingredient. And so when it's transferred, basically, and people have also talked about how it'll go to the opposite trajectory I don't know about this part as much, but it's been conjectured that the calm eater will eat nervously when they're not living their design. You know, um, I see more of the transference. I mean, here's the funny thing about color four. Color four always transfers. So I, I don't want this to be too complex too soon, but basically all colors transfer, but typically the color transfers when it's incorrect when somebody's not living their design, they're not nourishing their form, they're not making decisions with strategy and authority. Once strategy and authority grabs them and it's locked in, the color on the design side stops transferring. The color on the personality side always transfers, no matter what color it is, because the mind is meant to be able to move freely and to be able to move into these different areas. There's nothing holding it or locking it in the same way that the design has. So the design locks so the color, except for color four, that's why it's getting a little bit complex. So I'll just say, typically for colors one, two, three, five, and six, when somebody starts living their design and they really it, have this sort of awakening experience on the design side, maybe not conscious awakening even, but when their design takes over 
and starts making decisions for them. And they find themselves unable to make mental decisions anymore. And they find themselves sort of watching themselves make decisions because they're following their sacral authority or they're following their solar plexus authority or however it ends up for them. What's happening is the design side is no longer transferring. It's locked in to its correct color. They may still not be following their dietary regimen. They may have other issues. They may have deconditioning to do to get things out of their system, but the design is still, it's locked. Now, color four is a special color, just as tone five is the special tone. Uh, we don't have any tone fives here, but just uh, there's a similar relationship. Tone five, um, feeling, which is basically hearing, hearing is feeling, it's kind of the same thing. Um, that is at the foundation of, of tone itself, that all tone has to do with feeling in some sense. All tone is sound in some sense frequency. Well, color four is touch. And at the color level, all colors really have to do with touch or touch lends itself to all colors. The calm nervous binary exists in all colors. That the left variable is always going to be the calm and the right variable is always going to be the nervous, so to speak. And I'll explain what this means in a moment. But um, basically, even when you're following your strategy and authority, your color four will still transfer, but it's not harmful in the way it would be for other people. The way Ra described it is that each of the colors except color four has its own song, its own melody. You know, each one has its own melody. And so if your melody is da, 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 and then you're in transference, suddenly your melody is going da, 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 da. It's all out of key and, you know, it sounds terrible. And what living your design does is it returns your melody back. Da, 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 da. It gets you back in your melody. And this is true for colors one, two, three, five, and six, that they all have a naturally, I won't say fixed way of being, but they have a natural... Uh, ideal or their form has a sort of a deconditioned way of being, an undistorted way of being, where the color is not transferring. And so they return to the original song. They kind of return to the original blueprint. Color four doesn't have a blueprint. It doesn't have an original form. Color four is kind of like an elastic body. It's like neuroplasticity of the brain. It's It changes. And so color four is the most changeable bodies. Their faces change, their body changes, their forms change. So many things change for the color four body. It's the most changeable body. It has no original body. It's like these actors, you know, Christian Bale, who loses 40 pounds for a role and gains all this weight for a different role and looks like a completely different person from role to role. And if you look at Ra, he looked like a completely different person many times throughout his life, before and after human design and so on. So the body of the color for a person, including the face, including the head, all of it, the whole body, undergoes radical changes and can really transfer all the time. It can go to the different dietary regimens. It can get stuck on different dietary regimens. It's not a problem as long as it's on the right side of the binary as long as it's calm, not nervous, right? As long as it's following its calm dietary regimen. Now, why do we call it calm? Is it because these people are calm? No, they have an overproduction of stomach acid. They're over nervous, they're over amped up. They're over excited. They're over the top in all these ways. So they need calm to bring them down. It's like the Bill Burr joke. Uh, he says, um, his wife his wife told him, Bill, you have anger issues. You know, you just go from zero to 60 or zero to 90 miles an hour, or, you know, um, you, you just go to zero to 90 just at the drop of a hat. And he goes, uh, I'm never at zero. I idle at 60. You know, like that's what it is to be 
a calm digestion. I don't know that he's calm digestion, but it wouldn't surprise me. It's to be amped up. It's to have an amped up way of being, a high energy way of being. Now, something Mark Germain told me is he said, um, he said, Ra himself became so much calmer later in life that you watch his early lectures and he's so amped up. And the, the further he deconditioned and the deeper he went in his experiment, the calmer he became. But the thing is, calm digestion does not mean these people have a calm digestive system. It means they have an over acid producing system that has too much digestive juice, that is too amped up, that is too anxious, that is too intense, that is too much. It's up to 11 and it needs to be calmed down and soothed. And this is touch. They call it calm touch, right? Touch is um, what can calm us or what can excite us more than anything. Think about it. I mean, like think of a baby, you rock the baby, you touch the baby, you can calm and soothe the mother's touch that soothes the crying baby. But then also think about how much um, how much touch can be exciting and stimulating, tickling someone, or, you know, there's a lot of excitement and amping someone up that can come from touch as well. And you don't even have to physically touch, auras touch. This is why I like to eat alone because if I'm just sitting around auras that are touching me, unless they're all in a relaxed state. And you'll see that there are certain things that are calming. The left variable is always calming. The left variable side of each of the binaries. So the first color digestive regimen is consecutive, the left variable, which is eating in sequence. You finish eating this, then you eat that. That's calming. That's like the traditional left variable way to eat in courses. And you, you don't mix everything up. You don't eat your ice cream with your jalapenos, you know, or you don't alternate ice cream and jalapeno. You kind of, to alternate weird flavors with each other is to stimulate the digestive system. See, nervous eaters have an under-stimulated system. They need stimulation. We are, we're overstimulated. Calm is overstimulated. Nervous is under-stimulated. Ra jokes that the nervous eaters have a digestive system that's clinically dead that they eat food and it doesn't digest, it just sits in their stomach, that they need to be tickled and need to get up and move around and they need stimulation and movement and excitement and something to make them nervous a little bit because that nervousness gives them that adrenaline, gives them that, it amps them up just enough to digest. We need to be calmed and soothed and low, lower our amped up nature, the calm people do. But you can see that the left variable of each digestive regimen is calming, that it's calming to be consecutive. It's calming to eat the same thing every, every day or to eat seasonally or to eat familiar foods, to not have, it kind of makes you nervous to eat something you've never eaten before. Uh, it's calming to, to um, well, I guess I, in that case, though, I guess with taste, it is a little bit, they're, they're both restrictive in that way. And I guess the right variable actually is closed taste. So I guess it does make someone nervous to be too strict about being forced to eat the same thing too. So I guess for the second color, it doesn't totally follow because open taste, I guess it's calming to be able to be open to a variety of tastes as well. Um, but you can see for some of them, it's more clear than others. Uh, for color three, hot food. Hot food is more soothing. Having soup. When, when people are sick, what do they do? They have chicken soup. It's calming to have some soup, even just being warm in general. Hot thirst people often like keeping the heat up and not being freezing and cold. Well, it's very stimulating to be in a cold environment. And if you're already really amped up and stimulated, as we naturally are, calm people have a, you know, calm digestion has a very... Um, amped up way of being, you don't need it to be cold to amp you up more. You need it to be warm, to calm you down and to relax you. And high sound environments are more calm than low sound. Eating in silence can be creepy. Eating in a silent room with no sound, with nothing there can actually be very stimulating because you hear every little thing and you hear the rustle of the wind and you wonder if someone's outside and so on. So eating in a busy restaurant can actually be very calming if everyone's laughing and relaxing. And if you have a table to yourself, 
if you're not being touched while you're eating, if you're not being poked and prodded, even if it's just by an aura, someone sitting across the table from you asking you pointed questions that can be touching you and you know stimulating you in that way. Um, that can be very, make you nervous. I mean, it's all about being calmed. I like to uh, eat alone. That's the most calm for me. And then during the day versus night or in light versus dark, I like to have the lights on. I don't like to eat in a dark room. Um, and what all of the left variable has in common is that they're focused. So it's calm to have something to focus on. Even watching a TV show or a movie, it's actually very calming to watch a movie. I mean, maybe not a suspense movie or something like that, but having something to focus on is calming. And when there's a lot of chaos and nothing to focus on, it creates nervousness. So it's actually calming to have something to read. It's calming to be taking notes while you think of, you know, thinking of things, going over your schedule, looking at a calendar, going over. It's calming to do that. It's calming to watch a show or listen to a show or have have something, you know, read the newspaper with your with your food and so on. So calming is all about focusing and it's all about uh, removing stimulation. And so being in daylight or being in light is very calming. Being warm is very calming. Having sound is very calming, high sound, um, and so on. And the more you eat alone and eat in a calm way and are calm when you eat and even calm when you digest, it's not like you finish eating and you just immediately run around. I mean, having a period of time to digest and relax, um, I don't like driving or eating while driving, even if someone else is driving, obviously. Um, I don't like that. Being in motion is not calm, you know. Um, so, yeah, maybe for some caves people, maybe it is. I don't know. I'm mountains. So being outside of my mountain environment uh, already doesn't make me calm. You know? And then you have tone two here. And this is taste. And so what I was saying is that this is really what's going to bring you the most information. Taste, you can take a little sip of air with your mouth. Ra calls us mouth breathers. I'm tone up too as well. He's tone too. I mean, you have the same, uh, this is the same as Ra. Color four tone too. And the same as me. And uh, he... It's called us mouth breathers, but it's not really necessarily healthy to breathe through our mouth. It's that we get information breathing through our mouth. In fact, we sleep a lot better when we don't, because we don't need to be taking in information all night. Mouth taping can be really beneficial for mouth breathers. You can buy these little, this mouth tape so that you don't breathe through your mouth at night. Because you don't necessarily want to be taking in information all night. You're not going to get the same sleep. Whereas uh, if you go to a if you're meeting somebody or you're going to a party or you're out at a restaurant and you're normally breathing through your nose, you might find yourself go kind of take a little sip of air, take a little, take a little mouth breath of the air and that noticing the actual taste of the room. Taste people will typically uh, really avoid mouth breathing, anything gross. You know, they go into a bathroom and they're very, try to, be extra sure to only nose breathe because they don't want to accidentally taste what's in the air. So taste, people have called this the cognitive superpower, the tone uh, on the design sun earth. And uh, it is it is your cognition. I mean, it is the cognitive underpinning the cognitive architecture. Technically it is called cognition. And um, yeah, it's the intelligence of the form. It's taste. It's based on taste. And so noticing the, the actual taste in your mouth about how your taste may change, your sense of taste may change, that the more you embrace calm digestion and experiment with that, the more you your sense of taste becomes finely tuned. Um, the other thing I'll say is that it's not just about food. Ra presented this information about food, but then he later said, this is how you take in everything. This is how you take in medicine. This is how you take in information. This is how you learn. This is how you take in life. So it's not just food. It's not just food. 
So the practical advice for calm is going to be just paying attention to anything making you nervous or stimulating you or when there's chaos and then waiting and just intermittent fasting and not worrying about it, kind of letting go of that food anxiety and waiting for the right time to eat. And then when you are in that calm state, you can eat enough that it nourishes you. Um, but without the anxiety of having to find food, just letting go of that, there's a lot of fear around food. It's probably, you know, genetic trauma going back tens of thousands of years from times we've starved. And the fear of starving and realizing you'll never starve. There will always be food. And you can wait until the right time of day to eat. For colors one, two, and three, it's all about the food itself. It's about what they're eating. For colors four, five, and six, it's all about when they're eating. We call this conditions versus circumstances. Colors one, two, and three are what are the conditions of the food. Colors four, five, and six are what are the circumstances. What are the circumstances? So it's about finding when. But you find so many people, colors four, five, and six, who are transferred to one, two, or three, and they're so worried about what they're eating. And then you find all the one, two, and three people, and they're saying, don't eat at night, and I'm fasting, and I'm only eating once per day, and I'm only doing this, and I'm only doing that. And they're obsessed with when they're eating. So practical advice. Experiment with eating alone. Experiment with finding the right time to eat. Experiment with eating in a very calm environment where it's not just that you are calm, it's that your environment is calm. It's that you're not eating around people who are touching and stimulating you, even if it's just with the aura. And of course, many calm eaters eat around people. I mean, I'm maybe especially unusual in that I really like to eat alone. Most calm eaters I know don't eat alone, but I think they would benefit from it. I think they would. Uh, the other part of it is sitting down. Eating while sitting makes a big difference. Doing a lot of things while sitting makes a big difference. Being in repose is, is important. Helps to calm down, relax. All right, the right environment for you. This is valleys. And you have outer vision, tone three, uh, in your environment. So you're going to be especially attuned to, um, well, this is an environment that has something beautiful to see, kind of a maximalist environment. This could be like an environment, you know, those markets where they have uh, not just like a supermarket, but a gift shop that has really nice displays. And there's displays of beautiful objects to look at, like a gallery, a gallery. You know, having art on the walls, having visual stimulation. It's important for you to be in environments that are visually stimulating and have a very pleasing visual uh, form for you. And color five valleys really benefits from the low ground and benefits from being in certain acoustic environments. Valleys are very acoustic. Left variable, this is going to be narrow valleys. And so hearing things close up, headphones, earbuds, talking close to someone, sitting close to someone, making sure, I mean, this is acoustically sensitive, making sure that you don't hear the wrong things. If somebody says really hurtful words to you, or even if their tone of voice is hurtful to you, that can damage you more than it damages others. So just being aware of how sensitive to hearing you are, uh, and how important it is for you to be in the right uh, acoustic environment. And then the valleys, um, this can have difficulty with high elevation, but even more so with just being um, ungrounded. You know, valleys can really benefit from sitting on the floor, can benefit from having Moroccan pillows, not sitting in the high chairs, you know, um, having 
low places to sit. And you have a left variable environment. This is an environment where you need to be around people who are busy, not a bunch of couch potatoes. You don't need to be around a bunch of people who are not doing anything. You really will benefit the kind of co-working spaces, spaces where people are so busy working, they don't even notice you enter or leave. They're just so busy that they're not paying attention um, to coming and going. They're they're preoccupied, they're absorbed in their work. That can be a great benefit for you. And people are absorbed in what they're doing. So practically, um, ground floors are better, basements are good, staying low to the ground, low elevation is good for you. When you go to a high elevation place like Santa Fe, don't stay on any second floors or up any stairs or anything, and maybe even find comfortable low seats or low chairs or sit on the ground or um, ways to remain grounded. With narrow valleys, um, you're going to prefer certain acoustic environments over others. You're probably not going to like bad audio that is roomy, echoey, reverby audio. You're probably going to like the squeaks of the fingers on the guitar, you know, and you're going to like kind of a certain intimacy and closeness to talking. Um, not like somebody's across the room and you're hearing the whole room echo or not hearing a lot of music from the other room or sounds from the other room that could be really obnoxious to you. The wide valley is more about hearing distant sounds and narrow valley is close sounds. Being in kind of narrow box canyons. Uh, when you come to Santa Fe, it'd be nice to set up a hike at Grasshopper Canyon. It's a great uh, box canyon that's very narrow. You hear the reverb of the stream running through it and the birds chirping and so on. And it's a really unique acoustic environment where you hear the reverb. Uh, you know, it's a box canyon, so it's the size of a city street, a narrow street, and it just has walls of stone on either side. And you're kind of walking through this narrow valley. It's really incredible. The acoustics there. Going over to the personality side. Um, so color three, tone two. This is a power view. You may wanna check out Power View Press on Instagram. They have Power View. Uh, power View is political. It's here to see winners and losers. And tone two is uncertainty. If you look at tone one, tone one insecurity is always about how do I prepare? How do I prepare for everything as it currently is? We know these are the problems. How do we prepare to solve those problems or to be able to face those problems? Tone two says, okay, those are the problems right now, but what might there be in the future? In fact, there's problems we can't even think of yet. So I don't wanna prepare for any specific problem. I want to prepare for change. I want to prepare, it's like being a Boy Scout and being able to prepare for any problem, cultivating the ability to adapt and change and handle any problem that comes along, even the problems you can't prepare for. This is the difference in the one and the two. The one prepares for what it can prepare for, what can be prepared for. The two prepares for change, for what we can't predict we'll have to prepare for. So having tone two here, you really have an eye for uncertainty. You have an eye for um, being able to see what might change and what might not. But again, this is at the tonal level. So interesting how similar our charts are. I have tone two here as well. Um, but it's it's that when you're in the correct environment when you're nourishing eating the right food you know then the tone starts to come out and basically when you're around the right people and they're pulling you into seeing the world in terms of winners and losers and seeing who has the power and who doesn't this is what you're here to see you're kind of here to see in categories and here to see in divisions and people who come along and say can't you see what's unique about every situation and how we can't put people in boxes and how every person is completely unique? Well, that's the personal view. That's the transference. That's color six. The power view 
is not meant to see what's unique in each person. It's meant to categorize and put people in categories of the haves and the have-nots, the winners and the losers, the powerful and the dominated, right? The dominators and the dominated. It's kind of here to see the world through a political lens, to see who's powerful and who isn't, to see who's winning and who's losing, who's taking advantage and who's being taken advantage of. And the transference is personal, which is saying, well, we can't keep track of this because, you know, everything's different. Every situation is different. Like power view should keep track and know who's paying for things. If somebody paid for lunch last time, you pay for lunch this time, they pay for lunch next time. That's how power view works. Or, I mean, unless there's another compensation or trade of some kind. Obviously, with a completely undefined ego, uh, that may have its own education or wisdom there, but making sure that you're getting something out of it. I really appreciated you buying my drinks and food the whole time we were hanging out. Uh, it was hard for me to accept with my undefined ego. So that was good for me, something I've practiced and become wise about learning how to receive, learning that people enjoy giving. I enjoy giving to others. Why would I rob them of their enjoyment giving to me by not receiving, right? So I had to learn how to receive. But at the same time, with your power view, it's important for you to notice, okay, I'm doing all this for Jonah. What is he doing for me? You know, it's important. It's important to not just brush that off and say, no, no, everyone's different. Who am I to say, you know, he's giving back in different ways. Power view is here to keep score, here to keep track, here to be political, to see who's winning and who's losing, to go into a situation and to see who has all the power. Might not be the CEO of the company, might be the bookkeeper, might be the CEO's partner. Who knows what, right? Who has the power? Who's pulling the strings? That's what power view is here to see. And on the design side, when you're in the right environment, you're done. When you're eating correctly, following strategy and authority, you're done. Like you've done your work, There's nothing else to do. On the personality side, these are gonna always transfer and continue transferring. And they're gonna transfer depending on who you're around. So what you're here to do is notice the people you're around. Notice that some people are gonna pull you into the personality view. Others are gonna pull you into your correct power view. So some people are gonna, when you're just by being around them. And it's the same with motivation. And this is the really the crown of the whole thing. And, and, and what that motivation is here for is to really give to the other. This is your outer authority to other people. This is what you're here to give them, what they come to you for. And uh, it's the same as Ra, and it's the same as myself, really. Color three, tone three. It's pretty cool. You and me and Ra all have same colors and tones and you know, on both sides here. And what, uh, what people went to Ra for, what they come to me for, and what they'll come to you for is our ability to be a priest. And what does the priest do? It's like a motivational speaker. It's like a pep talk. The priest is here to pep people up. The priest is here to remain locked in with blinders on. See, the transference of color three is innocence. And innocence is seeing everything and observing everything and curious about everything. Color three isn't curious. It's not curious about anything because it has blinders on it, it has a goal. It has a desire. It's locked into that desire. If someone comes to you for a human design reading, your desire is to wake them up. And so you don't get distracted and sidetracked and pulled into a million different things. You stay locked in. It's like Ra. He was locked into strategy and authority for 25 years. People would say, but Ra, isn't there something more than strategy and authority? He'd say, no, strategy and authority is it. And they'd say, but aren't there exceptions? No, there's no exception. I mean, people came to him to get strategy and authority. And yet there was a real benefit, not the benefit of him telling them what he observed. Observing is what innocence is here to do. The benefit was him telling them basically what he was locked into, him preaching to them as a priest on his pulpit, and him giving them a motivational talk to align them to themselves. You don't have to tell somebody what you've observed to align them. You know, you, you go to a sixth color person to get a bunch of observations. 
And those observations may be useful, they may not, they may be important, they may be irrelevant, who knows, right? You go to them to get honest feedback observations. You go to us, the third color people, you and me and Ra, not for what we see, but for what we are and what we are locked into and our ability to motivate others and to align them with their purpose, to grab someone by the shoulders and say, this is what you're here to do. Do it. Don't give up on it. Go for it. You know, this is your purpose. Don't give up on strategy and authority. Don't give up. We're here to dispel the doubt. We're not here to tell them a bunch of random things we've seen. So the transference is to innocence. And innocence, innocence is the is always going to get people in trouble with culpable deniability. Innocence is where you give people enough rope to hang themselves. You give them, it's like, I've learned over the years of being deeper and deeper locked into my desire to build things in such a way that the other can't make a mistake. You know, innocence is house sitting and they say, hey, you should have a party at my house. By the way, don't have too many people over. If you do, we'll get in trouble. Then they come over, have a bunch of people, you get in trouble, they get in trouble. They end up getting a big problem from it. And then you say, I told you so. That's innocence. You know, innocence is giving other people enough rope to cause serious harm. But then remaining innocent because you have culpable deniability, you can say, hey, told you so. That's innocence. Desire is making sure that's impossible. Making sure it's impossible for the other person to make a mistake. Making sure it's impossible for something bad to happen because it stays involved. Desire, you can tell you're in innocence when someone comes along and and then you go, well, not my problem. If you're a desire, everything is your problem. Everything that enters your field, you are here to fix. And I know there's going to be exceptions. I mean, obviously, you're going to have a, a sacral response. But just something to notice that innocence is really, um, the innocence transference is basically kind of pretending to be innocent. It's feigned innocence. It's saying, hey, I didn't know any better. It's not my problem. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Sorry to hear that. Well, hope it works out. You know, it's this kind of like hunky-dory thing where when you're really locked into your desire, you're here to just stick with it. You're here like a dog that won't let go of the rope. You know, you're here to just, uh, just kind of dig into it and not let go and to remain locked in and to keep those blinders on and keep your eye on the goal. And don't forget why you're doing it. It's not some curious journey of wonder. There's lives at stake, you know, there's souls at stake. You came here and incarnated this time in a form of desire to be this burning pillar of fire, of flame, to ignite the hearts of others and to inspire them to live truly as themselves in health, in alignment, in the life that was meant for them. And it does matter. And what you're doing matters. And what everyone does matters, really. Except for the innocence people. I'm joking. Uh, so yeah, you'll you'll notice it. You know, the, the uh, motivation flickers. You'll notice who pulls you into desire and who says, don't worry about it. That's not your business. Anyone who tells you that's not your business, they're pulling you into innocence. Anyone who tells you don't worry about it, you know, it's not, it's, it's just no problem. Just be a bystander. That's innocence. But the people who tell you, oh, you can make a difference. It's important. The world needs you. That pulls you into your desire and that pulls you into your mission in this life. All right. That's it for the four transformations reading. I hope you've got something out of that. I know I certainly enjoyed doing that. And um, if you have any questions, I'd love to, to follow up, of course. But um, there's each one of those areas you can really dig so deep in. I, I hope that this has been a good overview. And uh, yeah, the, the world needs desire people to be in their desire, to be the leaders. Desire's the leader. And uh, the, the left variable desire, we call it the leader. And the world needs leaders. Uh, most of the world's leaders are innocence people transferred into, into desire. And they have a false desire and they're, they're full of a homogenized desire. They don't know what to desire. And they're not good leaders, not at all. 
the world needs real leaders, leaders who are locked in and aren't questioning. They have blinders on to the questions because they know, not some false Ajna knowing, but the, the true knowing of the heart, of the flaming, burning heart of they have seen firsthand Ra saw firsthand what strategy and authority does to transform lives. He's not here to question whether strategy and authority is valid or not. He knows it's valid. He's here to impart it on people. He's here to give it to them. He's here to align them to themselves. And that's what the world needs. Leaders who can really help others to be themselves. Thanks for watching.